Um, where in the world are you at this moment? I am located in Bogota, Colombia, at the tip of South America. Oh, and how is life in lockdown over there? Well, it's been rough. We've been in lockdown. This is our seventh, eighth week, I think. So it's been already. And we are supposed to go until May 11th. But My goodness. in all reality, I think what's happening is that they're going to keep extending it. Wow. Do you believe that it's going to go on longer than that? I do. I think that we're going to be here probably uh, mid-June, end of June. That's, that's my guess. Um, today, they have been letting some people go out. So uh, construction workers and manufacturing workers are allowed to go back to work. And um, as of today, people can exercise outdoors, which is progress. You know, We couldn't go outside for anything other than grocery shopping till today. But starting today, we can go and exercise outside for an hour between five and eight in the morning. So in some ways, you know, they're being so they're loosening up some of the regulations, which is good. I think people need that. Otherwise, mental health is going to just, you know, be bad. Yeah. I mean, I think we're, we're, you know, very much so. We've got two pandemics going on right now. We've got the coronavirus and we've got an anxiety and a depression epidemic that's going to be of catastrophic it's going to be unmeasurable the you know and the amount of people that are self-medicating pre predominantly in scotland with alcohol and drugs um you know a local gas station a local petrol station i was in and they said their fuel sales have went down by 30 percent but their cigarette and alcohol sales have went up by 70%. That's crazy. Well, yeah. you know, people are trying to cope. We, we, we're not beings that were designed to be confined, let alone for so long, you know? And what, what I tell my colleagues is that we're pretty much in, in prison and we're gonna be released. We're like prisoners, which is, you know, doing our time and we have to readapt once we go out. But Absolutely. I've seen a I've seen a surge of a dramatic increase of suicides here, um, alcohol consumption, substance abuse. You know, uh, household violence has climbed through the roof. It's really bad. And you know, I have I was working pr prior to the quarantine. I was working with clients with trauma, and fortunately, we've been able to do some online sessions because otherwise, I don't know how they would be dealing with it. Um, probably some of them would be considering hurting themselves. So what advice, what, 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 what advice would you be giving for people that are listening right now that are in, that are in lockdown? Uh, that's a good question. I, I tell people basic things. And the first thing I tell them is don't watch the news as often. If you're going to watch the news, whether it's written news or the radio or television, just do it once a day to catch up to what's going on, but avoid watching the news constantly because the, the one thing that meet the media does is bombard you with fear. And yeah. you know, the first thing you see is the word coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. And it's so ingrained in our mind now that our limbic systems are just going bananas, man. It's just insane. So the, the first thing I tell people is don't watch the news. And what I do with my mobile, I shut it down and I only turn it on to talk to my parents and to see if I'm getting messages from my clients. That's the only thing I'm doing. And stay away from any kind of media, social media and you know the news, stuff like that. Um, you know, as I was saying as of today, we can go exercise outside. So I recommend people exercise because it makes a tremendous difference. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I was, um, I had, a, I have a, an elliptic machine uh, back there that I'm using, but I'm considering going, you know, once or twice a, a week going out outside and jogging. Um, if we're not, you know, talking to other people and we're keeping social and physical distancing, we need, need to see other people. It just because it feels like it's a zombie apocalypse, <laughs> it's the end of the world, you know, and it needs that stimulation. We need it. We, 
We need to see a tree. We need to see a person walking a dog. Even if we're waving from the other side of the street, we need that. The brain needs that. Yeah. And they eat and nutrition. It's it's a very easy time to eat a lot of carbs and sugars and put on that weight. And so I advise people that they keep a healthy diet and they refrain from eating, which is really hard because when you're confined and there's so much uncertainty going on, you have that limbic system and you have you know all that cortisol being secreted into your bloodstream that you're gonna get hungry for anything that's sugary or or a carb. So it's it's very hard to keep a diet, but you know it's it's a good time to do it. You know, and it's a good time for self -re self reflection and self knowledge. So I, I have used this time to get to know myself, and I'm sure you have too. I mean, you know, I know some of your story and the progress you've made. So, you know, it's it's annoying, it's very frightening, um, it's upsetting, but it's a good time to 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 make some good changes too. So you work with neurofeedback and you work with a lot of tra tra trauma. You work with a lot of clients with trauma. Yeah, I do. And I also use a technique called brain spotting, um, which is which I learned uh, about four years ago and I really love. And I use it in combination with neurofeedback. And I've seen, I've seen miracles really for my with people with severe trauma and long last to get there uh, rather quickly and I you know fortunately we have technology and we can use it to heal to help people heal and I've been doing some um, some brain spotting sessions with my trauma clients and it's been helping tremendously for them to cope and get through this more efficiently because one of the things is that yeah, sorry I didn't hear that it's a wonderful tool, isn't it? It is. Brain it spotting. is a very wonderful tool. It's it's magnificent. The, the things you can do, and you know, being a recipient of it myself, I can attest to the yeah. profound changes that you experience. It's life changing. Yeah. And with the, the confinement, you know, people are gonna get in touch with previous traumas that are you know have not been fully resolved. And I think tools like brain spotting are helping a great deal. And I'm, I'm really happy that I'm getting to help people even in this current situation. Mm. I trained I trained in BrainSpot maybe seven years ago. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, 2013, I trained in BrainSpot and um, I loved it. Uh, I, I remember one day in my office, I'd been using it, and I was using little stickers on the wall for each individual. Mm -hmm. And I, like when, when I went in the next morning, this is that was the story, the part I missed. When I went into my office the next morning, and um, I hadn't cleared the little stickers off the wall, the whole wall was like a constellation of blue and <laughs> yellow and green, and purple stickers all over the wall. Right. Still laugh when I still laugh when I think of that. So, so you're you're talking about the limbic system. So for a lot of people, they may not even know what the limbic system is. So maybe we could we could talk a little bit about what what that actually means. Well, yeah, the limbic system is actually the uh, it's conform it's form of different structures so just such as the hippocampus and the amygdala, which are important for memory and survival, and there's two main structures that I that I always mention. One is your hippocampus, which is important because that's your biographical, uh, your, your biography. Pretty much every every component of your life history, it's going to be um, stored over there. So a lot of your life memories have to do with that. But it's also very important because this is where memory takes place. Memory and learning consolidation take place in the hippocampus. And it's also where you get your neurogenesis, is where your brain makes and sprouts new neurons. So you can stay smart, sharp, and young. And you know, when you have a cortisol stress hormone, the cortisol is gonna go to the hippocampus and it's gonna be brain not only to make new neurons, but also to remember and learn new things. So that's why stress affects stress and trauma affect memory so greatly. And then you have the amygdala, which is, you know, it's 
but the size of a peanut is a very small or very powerful structure in the brain which uh, which work whose work is to store everything that's emotional so your emotional memories particularly your bad memories are stored there and what the limbic system does is activate what you call call the fight or flight response meaning when your life is threatened somehow your first option is always to flee to escape the situation you know whether it's a predator or somebody trying to hurt you or a natural disaster the first thing your brain is going to tell you to do is to run and escape and you know make a break for it now if we don't get the option to escape the second option is to fight so we're going to fight that uh, you know the menace we're going to fight whatever is uh, threaten us with all our might and sometimes we can neither escape nor fight and that's when we get into the freezing response and somewhat with the confinement that's what we're experiencing you know we're not able to fight it because we don't we don't have a treatment we don't have a, a vaccine for it and the best way we're escaping it now is by staying home but the uncertainty is making us very scared the survival mode we're, we're surviving right now we're trying not to get infected with the virus and if we become infected with the virus the next thing is well let's make sure we have a strong immune system so your limbic system and everybody's limbic system around the world is on high alert and your 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 amygdala is like a guard you know it's it's like a sentry who's on guard and is looking for threats exactly <laughs> it's like the the queen's guard you know if you will and you know your amygdala is on guard and right now all of our amygdalas are doing over time because we don't know what's going to happen you know we hear news and we hear the virus is doing this the virus is doing that um you know we thought it was uh, specific to it was lethal for people over a certain age with certain conditions now we're seeing that it's not that it's not so the case that healthy people can get severely ill and can die too so the realization that we could get infected and we could die from it, it's keeping our brain on high alert 24 seven, literally. And what that, what that does, it makes you secrete cortisol, which causes inflammation, makes you more hungry, makes you more prone to eat sugars and carbohydrates. And therefore techniques like brain spotting and um, you know, heart rate variability help calm down the amygdala. So it's telling the amygdala to stay alert, but not to overdo it you know that's why people eat a lot that's why people cannot sleep well and it's our limbic system is that guard being on high alert you know um, and so if we don't do things such as exercising and e eating well well we're not going to help ourselves that the one thing i like about exercise is that exercise helps the brain release something called bdnf which is a it's a, it's a protein that helps with uh neuronal growth now, BDNF goes to, it's secreted in the hippocampus, the same area where cortisol goes and kills your neurons. So BDNF will help you make new neurons, will make you stay, you know, help you stay happier and more calm, but at the same time, it helps neutralize cortisol. So moving and exercising, it's crucial right now. I cannot stress that point enough. You know, and people, nowadays we have gyms everywhere, we have apps, we have options we didn't have 10 years ago and ironically, people are not exercising more. They're exercising less. So I would hope that with this, people would understand how important exercising and staying positive is. You know. So BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, and it's a growth factor that helps you make new neurons. So if you exercise, one of the reasons you feel happy and you feel really smart and you can focus more and you feel younger it's because the bdnf is being secreted so it's it's helping your hippocampus sprout new neurons that are going to go to other areas of your brain and i'm going to keep you protected from things like you know parkinson's and dementia and depression and anxiety and the list goes on and on and what triggers it is, mo is movement so if you go out for a brisk walk or you do you know mid to high level cardio you're gonna you're gonna get the bdnf going and what that's going to make you is going to make you you know less prone to depression less prone to anxiety it's going to help you sleep better um and it's going to put you in a more positive state of mind because that's very very important right now
So the cortisol that's being released from the fear, which is all around us, the fear of the virus, the fear of employment, the fear of money, the fear for family. And also, I'm guessing that because of the isolation, which is not normal for us to be isolated, that actually hurts the system. You know, we're, we're supposed to be cuddling and hugging one another and loving one another. And now we're isolated. That isolation, I'm guessing, would be bringing about a level of cortisol as well because it's completely not natural not to be around people. Yeah, it is very unnatural. And what you're saying is absolutely true. You know, we're social beings. We were designed or created to be social. And, you know, every time you hug somebody, you kiss somebody, even you shake somebody's hand, you get to release oxytocin and all these chemicals that are good for you. And I think one of the main mistakes that the media and our leaders have made is calling it social distancing. We should have called it physical distancing uh, because social distancing, people are taking it literally. And, you know, you walk down the street and people don't wave hi anymore. People don't even hold eye contact anymore. I'm walking down the street and I have people coming my way and they just jump to the other side of the, of the street and they don't look at me. And it's because we don't know who's carrying the virus. We don't know how infectious it is. We don't know how we can get it. And therefore we're suspicious of everybody, you know, even, even our, uh, sometimes our own relatives and loved ones. And I think the media and social media has played a huge role because the constant bombardment of fear has made us very, um, very weary and paranoid to a degree. And of course, you know, uh, if we're not able to hug and kiss, that's very detrimental because that's that's our very essence. I think that's what makes us human and differentiates us from other species, and that's what makes us very special. You know, so it's very important that you do things to keep the cortisol down. You know, such as meditating, breathing exercises, going outdoors and exercising, or exercising at, at home if you don't want to go out, and things like this. You know, I mean, we're thousands of miles away yet here we are communicated to some extent and you know we've known each other through facebook for a while but here we are having a connection and i think that's very important of course and you said paranoia you know people don't want to talk about people you know when, when, when it comes to mental health one of the biggest things about it is the stigma and nobody wants to talk about being paranoid and i'm, I'm actually writing an article um this afternoon for a woman that runs a charity on mental health and one of the questions that she wanted to ask was, what would be one of the indicators that you would notice that you were starting to head into anxiety or depression? Now, there's a list, but one of the things that people don't necessarily realize is that when, when your mood dips somewhat, it makes you more prone to fixate to almost like an OCD, like a compulsive part of it and you start to ruminate and you start to obsessively think about, you know, something that wouldn't normally bother you, something that normally wouldn't like, like for an example, we've got people on Facebook, they're now living their life through Facebook, okay? And the, someone puts a post up and you don't like my post, I start ruminating, why, why is Santiago, why is, why is he not like my post? Why is, what's wrong? And I'm getting messages from people like, why did you not like my post? I'm sorry, I've been really busy. I've not noticed your post. Um, but do you want to talk? Can we can we speak later on? Because I don't think this has got anything at all to do with me not liking your post or sharing your post today. So let's. I'm walking the dog at five tonight. Why don't we get some time in the phone and we start chatting and we figure out that people are starting to compulsively ruminate and and give energy to things that is just a normal life you wouldn't give a second thought to. Is that, have I explained mm -hmm. that? I think that's a huge part of it. Is It's a very big part of it. And and you're touching on a very important point, which is it's, it's come to the point where our self-worth is yeah. determined by the number of likes we get on Instagram and Facebook. You know, we, yeah. our self-esteem has become so attached to it. Absolutely. We don't, we've forgotten to love ourselves because of who we are, not, of, not because of what people say about our posts on social media. And 
it, it's dangerous because that be, you know if things drag along for longer that could become the new normal and yeah. i think that's not that's not healthy and you know the other thing is it makes people more radical into their ideas and you can see with politics or religion you know and everywhere in the world i'm sure in scotland here in colombia in the us people are so divided right now and yeah. i've never noticed people paying so much attention to politics yeah. as they're doing right now and and in and, and not in a healthy way, you know, in, in a very um, stressful, um, sickening, an anxiety, anger-driven way. I think that's just not it's right. Compared to what fundamentalism. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's that's a good word for it. Yeah, fundamentalism. People are getting radicalized. You know, it, 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 through the division, through the split, divide and conquer. So if we are out of the way, when we look beyond the coronavirus, there's a division that's going on between people that's creating, as you said, paranoia. And you, you used the word social isolation is the wrong, wrong terminology because people are taking it so literally. That yeah. Yeah. And you're we're right. so, you know, we're, we're so easily brainwashed. It's amazing even though in our history how far along we've come as the species how easy it is still to scare people and to manipulate people and we're seeing it right now and, I, and and i'm not saying you know i'm not trying to say that the virus is not lethal or we shouldn't pay attention to it because clearly it is we you know it's not something to laugh at as or the knees at however i just you know when when the when when it first started when people were you know panic shopping and and taking all the toilet paper and, and leaving you know uh, senior citizens without any groceries and i'm just thinking this you know this is the 21st century this should not be happening we have all the information available and yet some part of our brains is not computing it <laughs> we're just acting like primitive beings you know this feels like it's the you know it, it, we, you know it's the near than telling us it's not the homo sapiens that's acting right now and Absolutely. And it's just insane. It, it it it's unbelievable. And you know that's that's some of the other thing I, I always talk to people about in Pachin is we have to teach people to think on their own. You know, we have to educate people in critical thinking. I don't, I don't think our educational systems are doing that at all. I think they're doing a very very poor job at that. You know, they're, they're they focus on teaching math and religion and biology, and that's great. But how about what about critical thinking? You know, that's what we really need now. We need people to think for themselves. We need people to get educated on things like this and not believe anything that's thrown. I mean, look what's happening in the US. The president of the United States goes and says, drink bleach, bleach, and people drink bleach. I don't I cannot phantom for the life of me. How can there be people who can really take that literally and do it literally? I just don't understand it. Yeah. And I think if we taught critical thinking, people would go, well, you know, maybe that's not such a good idea, you know, because you could die from it. So let's not even consider what he's saying. I don't know. It's just... I, that, that, I think that's very, very valid. And I was, you know, I was getting goosebumps as you were talking because that's very aligned with my thinking as well. But, you know, we've got a war. There are many wars going on and we've got a war on consciousness because at some level people don't want us to critically think people don't want they want the lemon effect they want the sheep they want the masses but then when a situation like this occurs that mass like hysteria and mass like thinking shows just how much we need critical thinking and to be able to you know even people that can critically think that i know that run businesses very well they're still looking for the father to approve the critical thought that they've just had. Yeah. Or they're looking for their boss or their CEO or their MD. They're, they're making a critical decision, but still somewhere they're looking for the MD to approve their critical thought. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking, we're, our low self-esteem has come, has degraded so much that we now look for approval from any source you know and, and we get anxious when we make a decision you know and fear is a part of life i i, I always tell people you gotta get comfortable with fear and anxiety if you want to move through and you and you want to achieve bigger things 
There, you know, anything you try something new, there, there's some new level of fear that's going to pop up, or some level of anxiety. You know, if you if you create a new business, if you get married, if you get separated, if you have children, if you get a pet, if you move to another country, there's always going to be fear and anxiety associated with that. And it's best that you get comfortable with it because it's not going to go away. And Absolutely. that's where critical thinking comes very handy because we're teaching people or we've been conditioned to believe that we don't have a source, a reliable source or a leader telling us what to do, then it's not worth doing it. And what a clear example of this. Now, I would be hopeful that things will change. Uh, people we, we would become somewhat smarter and you know they would wise up or that the economy would change. Now, if you ask me personally, I don't think that's going to be the case because the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And with the things you're saying, seeing through the pandemic, <laughs> it doesn't make me too hopeful. But the only thing I can do is change what I do the way I think and do the best I can and hope that that would inspire others. Um, because, you know, I mean, it, for us who work in mental health and analyze human behavior, it's it's a good it's a good opportunity, you know. It's it, this is an, a huge lab where we can see all kinds of behavior. But I don't know. It's just it's too confusing. Uh, you know, uh, everything that you're saying, I completely I, I, I agree. I align with them. I align with the majority of things that you're saying. But until society can get geared up and educated sufficiently. To start dealing with the cause rather than the symptom, we're going to keep just we're just going to keep going round and round and round. And it's like I'm not anti-pharmaceutical, I'm not pro-pharmaceutical, but somewhere there has to be a place in the middle where if you're going to use pharmaceutical medication, you still have to do the hard work that goes along with it. Because otherwise, you'll be on pharmaceutical medication for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. Yep, and absolutely. It, and it breaks, it absolutely breaks my heart to see people that have chronic health conditions and they're still pouring half a dozen cups of coffee down their neck every day, loaded with sugar, eating cheesecakes and muffins and bread and gluten and all of these things. And the, the, you look at their pill pod and they've got five pills to contradict another five pills. Yep. And it's like, when, are you going to take, when, when are we going to start taking personal accountability for our mental health and stop relying on the, over here it's the NHS, the doctors, to give us a solution? Okay, well, you, know, you touched on something really important before we went live. And, you know, you said, is this a preview of what's to come? And I think that's a, that's a very interesting point you're making there in that, I think Mother Nature is sending us the signs, and if we don't listen, she's going to hone her skills and just her craft until she's going to come up with a much worse pathogen than this one. Absolutely. And we're not going to be ready for it, and we're just going to be wiped out. You know, I think Mother Nature is getting sick of our ways. Absolutely. And, you know, and if we don't, if we don't change soon, I don't see humans being on the planet for much longer. You know, whether it's another virus Absolutely. or natural disasters or a combination of both. Absolutely. Absolutely. I um I was out walking the other day there, Santiago. I was walking and I went, you know, Mother Nature has put up with man killing man for so long. And really I don't think Mother Nature gives a poo about that. But when man starts killing plants. It's going to whip back and we're there. It's going to whip back, you know, go ahead and kill one another, whatever. But you're not going to bury another hole in me. You're not going to destroy another 300 acres of my Amazon, of my lungs, of my earth. And, you know, it's 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 time to look in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, are we going to learn from this and are we going to be prepared to make a change? Now, I'm, I'm not going to say that that's not the case. I'm, I'm, I think a lot of people are going to change and for the better. 
Um, however, I don't I don't know if the majority of people are prepared and they're willing or even able to make that change. You know, it's a change is really hard, and learning from this is going to take a lot of thinking. I don't know how prepared people are to do that much thinking. I want to be hopeful, but I want to be hopeful you know. too. Yeah. Oh man, I've so enjoyed talking with you. I really have. I'm sure. I'm sure people. Same that are, I'm sure people that are listening have learned a lot. And you know, just I'm going to ask you one last thing before you go because I've taken up your time. We've spoke of the problems, and we're both hopeful. What do you see as the solution? I think that the first thing we need to do again is. Um, it's reinforced critical thinking. Uh, I think if we teach people to think as opposed to react, we've, we will gain a lot. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. And I think people should be, you know, I've seen touches of, of humanity and, and, and kindness around me with, that I didn't see before. And I hope that grows. I, I hope people become more kind. And I, th I think we become more empathetic and we learn to think on our own, we, we will come a long way. I'm not necessarily saying it's going to be a, a you know a 360 degree transformation, but I think it's the first step, you know, a good first step in the right direction. Beautiful. Wonderful. And on that note to leave you, thank you very, very much for your time. Coming all the way from Colombia, I wish you a wonderful day. And it's a real joy to see you and speak with you. And I'm sure everyone that's listening thinks the same. So thank you very much. Well, no, thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be on the same line with, you know, such great minds such as Antonio and Jay and people I really look up to. And again, you've been so kind throughout the years. And, you know, hopefully we'll meet soon face to face when all of this is over. I hope so too. Been a pleasure. Thank you very much. All the best. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Thank you.